All right. So, hello everyone. Uh, this is Dinesh again, and um, today we will look at our lecture three. Um, this um, basic introduction to our uh, programming language. So. I want to recap some of the basic concept before we go into the next complex level. Recap of functions. So remember a function is a set of instructions. It has a name and you can use that name to call or utilize a function on input data. Variables are pointer or shortcuts or nicknames to data stored in our memory. So function name and variable names are shortcuts for code and data stored in our memory that you can use. Then we have vectors, which is collection of items, and you can have numeric item or character items. Uh, these are basic concepts that you will be needing in this tutorial and the next one too. And just to recap that parentheses indicates a function name and assignment operator, this sign indicates a variable name. And in R, any word without a quotation mark is either a function or a variable in the R world. So yesterday I explained how do we access elements in a vector using locations and uh, names and logical expressions which is true and false. Most of our coding will be playing with act vectors, creating vectors, accessing elements inside the vector, um, using those tricks to create smaller vector or combining them, making bigger one, and then applying different kind of functions on these vectors. So vectors are important here that if you can imagine or visualize your data in a vector format, um, you can write R codes easily. You can, you can think about functions or you can think about um, simple calculations and applying them in vector. You can achieve um, several complicated calculation in few lines of code. So what I'm recommending here that you got to think about how do you put your data in a vector format. So we will do some, <clears throat> yesterday I covered um, just a simple um, operation on learning about properties of a vector, like is it character or numeric, is it um, how long, what is the length of it, what's inside it. You can also do arithmetic operations on vectors. So I'll actually delete all the L. So I'm making my environment empty. There's no variable stored in my environment. So I'm making this variable called A. It has 10 element. These are the numbers in it. And then I'm making the other element B and it has 10 element in it. Now, similar to what do you do with a single um, element? You can also do um, those mathematical operations on a vector. For example, if I do A divided by B, it will give me the ratio of each element in the vector A divided by each element on vector B. You can do A multiply by B, it will give you multiplication. And if you do A plus B, it will give you that. Now, for, for a correct um, arithmetic operation on a vector, both vectors should have same length. So here A, A has a 10 elements and B has 10 elements. So you want to have 10 in both. There will, will be um, like you're dividing element one by element one in both vectors. 
or you can divide B by A, you get 3 because that's a 3 time. Um, I actually created this way there, and that every element is a 3 time um, of A in the B vector. So this is helpful. For example, if you're calculating um, simple calculations like full changes of all your metabolites in a metabolomic study, then basically you create a vector of uh, metabolites in a condition A and a vector B of metabolite level in condition B. And you just divide using this formula B divided by A. And you will get all the full change values. Um, so vector operation makes a calculation in R, <coughs> like real complex calculation R um, easier. And for your coding, most of the time you will be handling vector and applying function on them. So if you can think about your data and putting them into a vector format, you are halfway through. Now, <clears throat> uh, yesterday I talked about how do you access vector element by location and names and billions. And you can also have, uh, I want to explain this logic a little bit more. So we, if we create this vector E and we put 10 trues in it. Now, <clears throat> true is also a word, it doesn't have a quotation around it. This is an exception of that rule that every word should have a quotation or not. So here, true has a, uh, it's a reserved uh, word in our language. So true, uh, if you use just true and false, I understand that you're using a logical rule there. And how do we use it? That if we say A in square brackets, we say E, then it'll give me all the elements because I have true for all, all elements 10 times true. So here we have 10 times true, which means give me back all the elements of vector A. Now, if we convert one of them into false, and then we say run E again, and then I say A, square bracket E. Now, it will give me only nine element, and it deleted 23. It didn't delete it, it didn't return 23, because we say it's false in vector E. So, many time, actually, you will be using this rule quite, this um, function quite often. Uh, <clears throat> how that you will create rules, these true and false rules and out, output um, based on some uh, logical calculation in one column and then you apply on the second column. My screen is Blurry, okay. It, it could be the internet speed. If the screen is blurry, it, it most probably internet speed. And if you say, if you're on your side, if it's too blurry, these videos will be available on YouTube uh, with high resolution. So what, what the software does, it when you live stream, it all depends on the internet speed. But later when, when the video is fully on YouTube, you will have clear uh, and high resolution video. Um, so it, it, I think it's, it's really depend on internet speed on both hand, on my side and your side. And since this coronavirus going on, the internet speed is kind of finicky these days. So we covered that part that how do you how do you create logical operators and then you can use those logical logical outcome true and false to access vector elements. That wasn't here. And then you can use that vector of billions um, to access element, for example, in vector A. Now we, we did this part, um, the change logical, I changed false and true, and then showed you that how um, this way you can 
rem we can return values um, or you can control what values are returned um, from the initial vector. So you can have like two false and then it will give you only eight value back. And so it removed the value 11 and value 23. So value 11 and 23 are not here in this vector outcome because that's false and false, okay? So, and we learned that you can apply these four basic arithmetic operations, operators on um, vector of some same length. You can also do, if I take A and multiply by two, just one, then it, what it does, it, it basically do the same mathematics, but it, does, it applies the, the same single value um, across entire vector. So several times um, you, you may need to multiply the entire row by a single value, um, whether it's a scaling, whether it's a normalization, or you're doing some sort of data transforma transformation. You can use that with this uh, um, vector operate, operation that you can multiply a single value all the elements inside the vector. Now, when you have two vector, you may want to calculate what's the overlap between these two vectors. And to do that, in R, they have this called percentage, percentage sign, and in a word, um, in, in between. What in means that left side vector in the right side vector. So how do you use it? We need to create other vector C in line 20, in line 19. And so I have some common numbers between A and C. And the way you use it is A percentage, percentage, inward. So A in C. And then it will give you a billion, which means you get a true and false that if element number one of vector A is present in anywhere in the C, it doesn't give you the location in the C, it gives you true and false if it's present in C. Now, remember the rule that how do you, how do you use logical Boolean values to access the values? So if you wanna know the values, all you have to do is say A, square brackets and put these boolean outcome into a square bracket and access values inside A. So that way you get that first you decide inside the square bracket that if what elements out of A are present in C. And then you use the vector indexing square bracket to get those values. So put them in square bracket and then you put A, uh, you write A in front of it, then it will give you well these seven values which were present in A and C vector. Now these, these overlap calculations are helpful when, you, when you're trying to make Venn diagram or when you're trying to find that if uh, values found in one condition are also found in other condition. So you can create two vector, uh, for example, two chemical names and use, then look at the overlap that how many chemicals are present from one vector and also in the second vector. So <clears throat> this was one advanced level from yesterday that you can use, um, you can get property of vectors and different attributes of a vector and now we can do uh, some basic mathematics on, on vector levels. Now these operators, these arithmetic operation and applying them to vector, you will need them almost every time you write in our code, you will need it. So let's do the next level that now we have numerical data, we have them in a vector format. Um, 
Now the true beauty of our come is like the statistical part then. How do we use those vector for statistical analysis? And I will first cover the basic statistics, then we will look at some basic uh, statistical tests like t-test or linear regression and in R. So <clears throat> we need to create a couple of data. So I will remove the old variables. So remember um, yesterday I showed you a command call, um, a function called sample and sample takes a vector. So here it takes a vector one to 100 numbers. And then we asking that give me 20 uh, numbers back and randomly selected. Oh, sorry. So we can see F is these 20 values, they are between one to 100. And we can calculate other vector G that has another 20 values between one to 100. And we get a vector H that has 200 values from starting from one to 1000 vector. So these are randomly selected. So if I run these commands again, because I'm doing the random selection, you will see in this win environment window here, the number changes. So if I run this command, you'll see number changes because every time you run it, it does the randomization and select ra randomly new samples. But the, but the window for the selection is one to 100 here, one to 1000 here. Now, you can combine vectors um, by again using the seek function. So here, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm creating three vectors. So vector one is a sequence of one to five, vector two has four element, and vector three is a sequence of one to five again. And now if I say I, because I'm using C function again, and I'm putting input all three vectors as an input for the C function. I'm basically making a single vector by combining them. So this is helpful when you're trying to merge data set. So this is the basic operation when you're merging data set. Like you have two tables and you want to merge by a row, that's what happens, that it takes vector one from one table and vector two a vector one from other table and then immerse them using this command. So, now, <clears throat> when you have these vector F, G, you can apply basic statistical methods. And so let's cover these basic statistical method that you can apply on our vector f, g, and h. So if you type mean f, it will give you the average. It's, it's a simple, simple function. It takes all the element uh, of f um, vector, it sums them up and divided by number like 20. If you wanna know like exactly what happens in the mean function, you can just type mean, or oh, actually you have to type this. No, it doesn't. Sorry about that. You, you need to look at the R code for that. Um, in the old version of R, it was used to show function, like you can, you can look at the entire function. Now it's just showing the namespace. Um, the next function is median. It's same as mean that, um, um, not, not mathematically not same as mean, it's just finding the middle point and uh, ignoring the outlier. So mean, mean is really sensitive to outlier and median is not. And next is standard deviation. So you can say SD. So that is um, how much each element on average deviate from the, the mean value of a vector. You can do quantiles. 
So quantile goes like this, that you need an input vector x um, or input vector will be, let's take a bigger one, which is h because it has 200 values. Then it needs probability and you need to find um, 0 0.25, 0 0.50, 75, 1.0. So it gives you, this is how you calculate what are my quantile values. And you can change the probability that I want to do uh, quantile by uh, increment of 10, then you need to provide those values in this vector here. Uh, and you can do quantile, tertile, pentile, whatever the way you want to look at data um, in these bins. So these are the basic statistical descriptive statistics of uh, uh, a vector. There are many more functions. You can calculate kurtosis. You can look at outlier. You can find um, uh, um, deviation from median, or you can look at the distribution. Uh, you can plot the vector, and you can find this function in the reference card. So what you can do, you can try out those function for a vector that you can you generated in your code. Um, now we're gonna apply student t test, and some other statistical test on these vectors. So t test uh, takes two vector as input. And it's a function known as t test, and you need to provide. Let's say we say f, and we say g, and that's a simple example of a t test. Actually, that 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 is the t test in R, and it's gives you back. Uh, what's the t value, what's the degree of freedom, what's the p value. And so the most of the time you're looking for the p value. But what you're seeing, it's a p value on the screen. And that's okay if you're doing one t test. You can just copy the p value and write it down some, somewhere. But when you want to uh, compute t test for, let's say, for your entire data set, of 200 variables or metabolite or chemical measurement, then you need to save the p-value in a variable. And for that, what you do is we call it res is equal to t-test uh, f and g. So you need to store the outcome of t-test result, which is this, what is displayed on the screen as a variable. So I'm using variable operator here, and I'm saying the store the result of t-test in this variable. So now we have a, a result of t-test as a variable res, and it says it's a list. Now, if you click, if you type res, it will show you, oh, it's actually, yeah. It will show you the outcome on the screen. But if you type res and dollar, then it will give you a list of all the different values that it calculated and that are available directly for other calculations. Or you can export them and access them. Now, it does a lot of calculations so you can see it, does, it has statistics, parameter, p-value, confidence interval, estimate, null, standard deviation, and so on. What value we want is a p-value. And so after the dollar sign, you type p dot value, and it will give you the, the p-value for that student t-test. So if you're doing single t-test, you can see that on the screen. But most of the time, we don't do a single t-test. We're repeating it for many chemicals and metabolites or variables. And then you want to access the p-value back. And that's how you do it. You save 
the result of t test as a variable in the R environment and then you use the dollar sign. So this is where the dollar sign comes handy. The dollar sign allows you to get the stored value in, the, in that list of results. Now, now you, you're wondering what is a list in R? So list is, um, it's also a vector, but it's a special kind of vector that you can, you can store any type of data in it. So I told you um, that you have numerical data and characters. Now you can go a little higher level. How about I make um, vector of vectors or vector of um, character vector or vector of numerical vector, I wanna merge them. So in, in basic R uh, object like a vector, um, you can't do that. So that's how R provide, that's why R provide you a other data object type, it's called list. A list is flexible. So you can add different data object types into, into a list. And what I mean by that is, list. So in R you create list by this command function called list and then you type that I have my vector 1 equal to a comma vector 2 equal to it's actually f a is not a variable and g then I say what is our objective today? And I, I provide to learn statistics. Then I can say, okay, what is date today? And I say 04, 02. And I can say, um, let, let's keep it simple. So that way, and we can save this as a test list. So how test list looks, yeah. So <clears throat> this way you can see that, okay, that this is great because I can store my vectors, both of them, then I can add some more information like what is my objective, what is my, what did I learn, what problems we have, all that in the list because list is flexible. You can have date, you can have characters. Um, so you can have characters, uh, dates, and you can have numerical data of any length. You're flexible. You can put complex, more complex things like tables or data format, data frames, or you can put website address and all that. So list is really flexible. And that's why t-test function is creating a list object as a result. So instead of giving you a 10 vectors or 10 time values, it gives you a single object, a list object, as a result, and then you can see the dollar sign here. And whenever you want to access element in a list, you can use a dollar sign to access it. And for example, list and a dollar sign, and it will give you, R Studio makes it easy that it will show you what elements, what information we have in this list. And so if you say test list vector one, then it will show you the vector one that was stored in list test list. When I make the test list, I use list function and then I provided um, a name of an element and then I provided the value. That's how we make the list. So you need to provide any, this name could be anything you like but it cannot have spaces. It cannot have like weird uh, signs and it cannot have, uh, uh, I would not recommend using upper cases when you define these names. 
all right so that was the list object and whenever you do statistics in r result most of the time will be a list object so you need to save that list object first and then access the values that were inside that list object so that's what we did here that we used t test between two vectors and then we save the result object as a list res and then we access the p value inside it now t test comes with different parameters and the, to know those parameters we type a comma after it and we press tab and then it will give you that what kind of t-test you want to do. Like you can have a pair, variant sequence, true or false, alternative, what's a hypo alternative hypothesis, is it greater, two-sided or less or not. Now that all depends on your experiment, your data structure, distribution of your data, that it's normally distributed or not. Uh, if you're looking for one-sided effect, two-sided, that all depends on your question. Uh, but to do that, the simple thing is you type a comma and then you type press tab and you will get these different options. But that, that part is diving a little deeper into testing um, the structure of data and then decide that what will be an appropriate combination of t-test. All right, so now we're going to do correlations. Since we have two vectors, we could compute correlations between them. And in our correlation function is simple core, and it takes two vectors input A, um, no, F comma G. Both vectors should have same length. So here I have F 20 elements, G 20 elements. Then you can compute a correlation between them. And it will give you the, um, this is the R square value that the correlation is really low. So it's not close to one, it's on the other side. And that is expected because uh, these are random data and there should not be any correlation between random data. Now if you say like oh that, that's R squared but I want to have the p value of correlation and that's why you do correlation core dot test f and g. So you do core dot test f and g. Then similar to the t test result you get this object back and it gives you the p-value. That p-value is 0.69, which is way far away from b significant. Now you you wonder like, oh, how do I access it? And you do exactly the same we did for t-test. We say rest is equal to that, and then we type rest dollar, and I want to know the p-value, and you can get the p-value. And actually, you can save the p-value as another variable if you wish. So that way <clears throat> you can compute a correlation. If you need the p-value, you use the function core.test and you save that result into a list object and then you can access the p-value inside that object. <clears throat> Let me repeat it. So in any statistical test in R, it will give you a list object back that will be displayed on the screen. You need to save that object in R memory as a list here. And then you can access different values stored in that list object. You will be needing this three steps most of the time when you do statistics in R, building models, building complex statistics, or anything around uh, that. So those, those two are the really simple statistical tests in R, like a student t-test or a correlation test. 
Now you can wonder like, oh, I, this is the pier sun, but I want to have the spearman or some different kind of uh, distance metrics. Then in, in uh, code, code test after you type a comma and tab, it will give you those options that what kind of method you want to use. So you, by default is Pearson, but you can use Spearman, Candle, and you have to look at the documentation of what other options are there. But if you have, uh, so these are inbuilt distance matrices in an R. But if you say, oh, I, I want to use some fancy distance metrics uh, developed by some guy, um, then you need to look at the internet if the, the researcher who developed that fancy distance metrics provided a function to calculate uh, those uh, distance matrices. And then you can use that function directly in your code. But you need to understand what is inbuilt in an R and what distances are not available. Then you can contact the researcher, look at the internet if there is a function for that distance matrix. So on the screen window, we see um, just one to ask that how do we uh, adjust p-value? And p-value adjustment, oh, you need to have um, more than one p-values. So let's create sample. I wanna have p-value between um, 0, 0, 0 to 0.1. Now, how do I create p-value vector? Let's say 100, and we divide it by that. Yeah, that looks like a p-value vector. Okay, so. Let's say this is our p-values for 100 student t-test. And we can call it p-wells. Okay, and if you wanna adjust for false, by, false discovery rate, these are a little complex. Just to answer your question, um, what you do is it's called p dot adjust and you provide these pair of p values by default you have to look at what's by default and for that you need to type p adjust so the default method bonferroni so the default is bonferroni and but if you want to use fdr you can use method equal to FDR ah, in quotation FDR and then it will it will correct all the p-values now since this was simulated data they all all corrected FDR are same but in the real world uh, real world example they will be different um, p-values for just after adjustment and if you do um, nothing, it will apply Bonferroni, which is basically multiplied by 100. So that's that's a, um, a little advanced question when you when you do hundreds of t tests or hundreds of linear regression models, um, you have a vector of p values. And you need to supply that vector or p value to this function p dot adjust. And then you provide the method that what method you want to use, which is explain here that it could be Holmes, Hosberg, Homel, Bonfroni, depending on what you're doing. If you're doing gene, gene word association studies, you probably want to use Bonfroni. But if you have like metabolomics data with 10, 20, or 100 variables, you probably want to use FTR. But these two commands shows 
how do you adjust p-value for multiple hypothesis testing. Um, I'll put a note here, p-value adjustment, okay. Now, so far we look at just the linear correlation, parametric correlation. And when it's a linear parametric, the assumption is the data are normally distributed. But when data are not normally distributed, there are non-parametric statistics there. So for that, we, we call them uh, crystal crystal um, wallace test. This is a non-parametric ANOVA. And it takes two vector. Number uh, first is in numerical data and second is the categorical data. So let's create these two vector. So K, I'm making again simulated data. I'm repeating uh, class one 10 time, class two 10 time and class three 10 time. So let's see, if you type K, you can see that class, class one, 10 times, two and three. This is all categorical data. Then I'm repeating L, um, male and female. So you can see male and female, they are random. If you wanna know how many male and female we have in this vector, the command is called table. So when I generate a random data uh, 30 times, I get 18 female and 12 male. Uh, if you repeat it again, 16, and that's more equivalent. So we have almost half and half female and male in, in vector L. So table is a quick um, tabulation of how many, uh, what's the frequency of unique element in a vector? So, so in, a, in vector L, how many elements are male and how many elements are female? It will give you that table back. Now we create two numerical data, J1 and J2. They both have 30 elements and they will be between 100 to 200. So I have two numerical vectors. I have K which has uh, three type of elements, class one, class two, and class three. And then I have vector L that has male and female. So to use Crisco test, um, which is ANOVA in non-parametric way, you need to provide a numerical vector, should be J1, and then provide the categorical vector. So we provided K. And that way you will get ANOVA if there is a difference between the values in class one, class two, and class three for vector J1. So we take the vector J1 and we take the first 10 values, second 10 values, and third 10 values. They represent class one, two, and three. And then we do a non-parametric ANOVA if there are significant differences. And the results shows there are not because this is random data. So random data should not have those differences. That's how you do a, a non-parametric ANOVA. The parametric ANOVA is a little complex, so I didn't cover it. I um, wanted to show that how to use categorical uh, data and a linear vector together to compute a non-parametric ANOVA. We cover the correlation test, okay. Non parametric ANOVA. Now, the, again, let me repeat it that keep thinking about that how I am 
using vectors. These are simple vectors like a one dimension representation of data and then feeding them into different R functions and getting a result back. So it gives you a little more idea <clears throat> that in yes, in R it's all about vectors. That you can create vectors, when you import data it will be vector and then you can use you combine those vectors so you can use two vectors in t-test or correlation test or a more complex like uh, non-parametric ANOVA test. Now the next one is regression models. So let's build a simple regression model. So it's a linear model and regression model uh, function takes a formula and then it computes a um, um, regression model and then give you beta coefficient and p-value for it. But those two parameters you are interested. You can also get confidence interval um, and some other values, um, useful values for a model result. So to do a linear model, it's simple. You type LM, which abbreviated linear model, and we want to compute between, let's say, F, this sign G. It's a formula symbol in R, and if you type it, it will give you what's the coefficient directly for a model between F and G. So coefficient is 0 0.08, which is really small, that which is expected because it's a random data. Now, you want to have p-value of this model. Again, we put the data in res, and we type res. Uh, Is my no. uh, for linear model, you need a one one um, a second function. It's called summary to get the p value. So summary function takes the outcome object of linear model and then it computes. It basically transforms the data. It represents the outcome linear model in a way that you will get the p-value. You will get better access efficient t-value standard error in a nice table or format. Now what you want to do is store that as a second object and then you can access one and coefficient which is a table and the p-values are here that p-values of linear regression between a um, no between f and g is 0 0.69 and the beta coefficient for that is 0 0.08 now this is a table so it's a two-dimensional representation of data that we will cover in the next part then how do I access how do I get these values out because that's what you want in this linear model so we will cover that in the next part that how do we import um, tables and how do you make data frame and two-dimensional data and then how do we access values uh, sort of like a rows and column wise so linear model they have two steps that you need to first fit the models then you use the summary function to get the p-values beta coefficient or other uh, confidence interval values now yesterday just one asked me that how do we adjust uh, the models so if you want to adjust the model, uh, we will take these variables j, j2, k, and l. So where is my here? Adjusted model. Now, I 
cannot explain in this lecture what says adjustment mean in regression world modeling. Um, simple world, simple explanation is that if you have uh, two variables correlating with a third one, then you want to make sure that the third variable um, you want to basically tease out what is the core, what is the contribution of first two variable on changes in the third one. Yeah, sorry, I, I need a whole whole new lecture on explaining the adjustment. I, I don't think I can do it in a simple way, but just to just to show how it is calculated. For, for adjusted regression model, you need to use a function called GLM, which is generalized linear models. And we say J1, and I want to do J2, but adjust it for K. So the plus sign will do the adjustment and then you say now give me the summary and rest work. So then you get this second table here. So this you see this plus sign? So the plus sign is adding a other predictor k and so you can also add other predictor what was the l and there's no limit how many predictor you want to add in this regression model. The plus line is basically adding an extra predictor. So now you can see that, yes, in the first model we, we had oh, J2, that was significant. Uh, after adjustment with variable k and when we added the second variable l uh, j2 is still significant which means that even though we adjust the model by variable k and l the correlation between j and j2 uh, was significant And if you want to do interaction, the symbol is star. So star shows the interaction between J2 and L. Now these are terminology that you need to learn some, uh, probably they're, they're nice tutorial on regression modeling on internet. So you need to understand the basic concept that what is a regression model and what's the adjustment, what's the interaction, and what are the better coefficient, and what's what are the confidence interval, and how do you do how do you interpret the result of linear models? That I will I cannot cover that in this tutorial. Um, what I'm saying that how exactly you do it, you use the GLM function, and then you provide the outcome and the predictors on the right side. So left side of this formula symbol outcome and then predictors and if you're using the plus sign which means you're adding more predictors and if you're using the star, um, star sign that is showing the interactions and similar to the linear model you need to save the uh, fitted uh, object first and then you need to use the summary function to get the beta coefficient or p-values so that is a summary of how we generate vectors, numerical vectors, and then we can use those vectors for doing little complex calculations like calculating ratio across all elements, using those vectors for t-test, ANOVA models, or linear, linear regression models, and adjustable model with multiple predictors in it. I have five minutes and I want to show you how do you import data from an Excel sheet. So 
let's look at the Excel sheet. I don't know if you guys downloaded the test data from the Google Drive location. If, if you haven't, you can go to the Google Doc, um, Google Doc and there is a Google Drive link for a folder. You need to download this data, R101 test data. And I wanna just show you how the file look. So this is a, um, a test metabolomics data and I have four sheets in it data metrics underscore so data underscore metrics a data dictionary sample metadata and analysis sequence analysis sequence is empty because I couldn't get the information about who run the sample and what time um, data metrics is basically first row so in compound IDs these are arbitrary IDs like compound 001 to n and then you have first uh, first row is a sample ID and first column is a compound ID and the first row is showing sample 001 and so on mm, so how many samples we have we have 108 samples in this data set so this is the data matrix tab data dictionary showing um, the first column compound IDs and different information about these compounds like compound name, PubChem ID, CAG ID, and you can have any information about it from like retention time, inch keys, or smiles code, and so on, pathways and classes, and uh, depending on from where you're getting the data or if you're generating, you wanna have as much information for these compounds. The third sheet, sample metadata, is information about samples that what, um, what categorical or other linear data, uh, continuous data we have for samples. For example, here we have column B treatment that sample one was early fasting insulin infusion and then sample 27 was GLP high dose and sample 51 was GLP low dose. And there is no limit on how many columns or how much data you can have in this sample metadata sheet. And second, uh, column C is a time point, is a continuous time variable at what time samples were taken. So if you're doing metabolomics data analysis, I would recommend your data to be formatted in this way, that you have data matrix, data dictionary, and sample metadata. It makes data import in R really easy. So to import data in R, directly from Excel, we need a function called read XLS. Now, you have noticed probably there's two column signs. What the two column sign means, that left side of two column sign is a package name. So read Excel is a package name. Remember what package is, it's, it's, a, com it's a basically collection of function coded by a developer and he shared it with you or with everyone over the internet. Two colon, off, right side of two colon is a function name. So it's intuitive that we can say read Excel, two colon, and if you press tab, or it will show you automatically our studio, then you will get a list of all the functions that are inside that R package. So read Excel, two colon, and you will you press tab and you will get all the functions. So that way you don't need to like type much. You can, when you type RStudio, it will suggest you what is the nearest function to those four alphabet or character you typed. We are interested in read Excel as X function, which is intuitive. It will read an Excel file, but we also provide them a parameter sheet what seed to read? It's data dictionary. So remember the Excel seed has three one, uh, four, one of them is a data dictionary. And we wanna store that as in a data frame calling CDF. So if I run it, now you see CDF is available in our environment here. And if you click on it, then you can actually see, um, so I, I should make it easy uh, for looking at the data that were imported. So you can see that what columns we had 
in data dictionary seed in the Excel file and how they were imported. So they were all imported and you can see that they were they're all there. And similarly we run NDF and SDF. So CDF for compounds, data dictionary, NDF for data metrics, and SDF for samples. So this is sample data. I wouldn't click on the NDF, it's too big. Um, RStudio kind of slows down when you have too many data and you're trying to view them into this viewer. It's good for a smaller data set. So my time is up and we will cover from here tomorrow when we try to make um, summarization of a data frame and plotting um, plotting it okay so I ex in some way I explain you um, idea vector and I strongly advise you to think about how you can format or visualize, imagine your data in a vector format. And then you can start using all these functions in R that are available for vector operations. And tomorrow we will look at more than what we do with this Excel file in terms of a little more statistics and some more graphics. Um, okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna end this stream.